Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of CNB Bazaar Buzz here on the NDTV network. I'm Cyrus Tabar and here's what we have on the show for you today and it's a bit of a Japanese special. The Lexus ES300 Hybrid. Two Suzuki's go head to head. And we visit the Yamaha Museum in Japan. Now, hybrid technology is something that everybody's talking about and it's an interim step before we actually hit all electric cars in India. And uh, one of the big promoters of hybrid technology in India, of course, is the Toyota Group. Now, Lexus is the luxury arm of Toyota and it has a massive hybrid portfolio for India. And it's now got a new car there, the ES300 hybrid. I drive it around and check it out and uh, see if it's a real worthy contender in the luxury sedan space. Check it out. Lexus has been in India for about 18 months now and has launched a wide variety of cars from its SUVs to its sedan flagships like the LX and LS. And now just a little over a year after launching the ES in India, here is a brand new one. And no, this isn't just a facelift and an update. This car really is brand new. A new platform, a new look and more importantly, more space in the new interior. So let's take a closer look. Now, if you think that the ES is inspired by the LS in terms of design, you're actually quite correct and even the Lexus uh, engineers admit to that because they do want to head towards a more family-oriented look like uh, Audi, BMW and Mercedes have been doing. And uh, as with most Lexuses, Lexi or however you want to pronounce that, uh, everything sort of converges into one point. So you've got a whole bunch of slashes and cuts and lines and everything sort of tends to come towards this Lexus logo in the middle. Now, does it work? Well, design is personal. Some people like it, some people don't. I do think it's just a tad bit over designed. There are just too many things happening and of course the spindle grille, this new iconic grille that Lexus has been putting on all its cars, it has grown much larger from the old one and now it even has two little horns on the top here, of course chrome festoon. But everything is really well put together in terms of fit and finish. The lines are absolutely phenomenal. The quality of everything is just absolutely great and now you do get these triple LED lights again inspired by the LS. There are of course other details that I do love on the car and one of those, and I really do must mention this in the review, is the fact that this thing gets 18 inch wheels which are not very well designed or the design might not be too modern, but the finish, now that is absolutely mind blowing. In fact. Lexus does the best wheel finishes from any manufacturer in the world and these wheels aren't just cool, they also have a technology that actually reduces the amount of noise they make and they pull in cold air and they sort of push out warm air or two. The other thing about the car is of course the fact that it does have a sloping roof line. Now it might be a three box sedan in its conventional sort of form but it does have this very very cool sloping uh, roof line which makes it very coupe like. And so we come to the rear of the car. Now the rear is where the big design changes versus the last generation are. Of course there are some in the front too which are very obvious but the rear is completely different, completely new generation Lexus. Now again like the front it's a little over design and this spoiler in my opinion just looks a little out of place. It should have had uh, maybe a lip in the boot lid itself. But just look at the number of sort of steps it has if you count. That's one, the spoiler. There's another one here, another one in the chrome accent piece. Another one in the tail lamp, goes back inside. It's just too much, it's a little too busy in my opinion. But again, fit and finish. Lexus gets that so, so right. The paint quality is just so perfect. And to be honest, it's not a bad looking car if we take the whole 
sort of packaged together. But again, design is something that is a little personal. It does definitely have a lot, a lot of street presence though. So now that we've had that closer look at the design on the new ES, let's quickly talk about how it is placed and what it goes up against. The ES globally has moved upward in the Lexus range. Where it originally was a C-Class and 3 Series rival, Lexus has now moved it up a launch and it takes on the likes of the E-Class, 5 Series and the Jaguar XF. And if that's the segment it wants to play in, how it feels inside is more important than how it looks outside. Now just like with every other car the Lexus makes, the interior of the ES is a symphony of really well put together leather, uh, which is all of course soft touch and attention to detail that actually just bewilders people in terms of the stitching for example. But there are again pieces here, uh, to be fair, which are not up to the mark. For example, the plastics here are a little scratchy and again on the door, sort of the lower half of the door, they're just not perfect, not meant to fit in with the rest of the car. What you do have, of course, is the new Lexus design in terms of the general dashboard orientation. So you have the stepped, sort of layered design on the dashboard and you have the big infotainment screen, which is sort of on the same level as your instrument cluster. So don't, you really don't have to move around a lot when you actually want to see something on the navigation or on the radio. That said, just like with the LS and just like with every other car they make, the infotainment user interface and just the little touchpad controller that you have here is just well just not good enough for this segment in fact it's just not good enough in general i just can't seem to get used to it it's just not intuitive enough to use i personally just think a normal knob or a touch screen would have been more than enough to actually control it this direction is something lexus definitely needs to go away from what is remarkable about the interior apart from the sheer quality though is the nvh level when you do get moving, you can barely hear a hum, as Lexus has used a huge amount of sound deadening all around the car, including the car's floorboards. And a quiet ride is not just comfortable for passengers, it also reduces fatigue for the driver. Now you do rarely find me in the back seat because of course I do prefer the driver's seat there, but considering the fact that the ES is suited for an audience that does spend most of its time in the back, it's only fair to get back here and to see how the good life feels. Now, uh, it does come with a chauffeur package, so you do press a little button on the side of the front left seat and it does move ahead, giving you a whole bunch of space. There's enough space to play a uh, game of football here. And you also get a whole bunch of other little bits and pieces. So for example, the ES, that's a backrest that actually reclines. Now, on paper it's just 8 degrees, but 8 degrees does make a huge difference when you just want to lay back after a tiring day at work just want to go home in that traffic filled fun. You also get a whole bunch of other controls like heated seats for example, you get controls for the infotainment system and a little control to put down the blinds or to put it up if you so desire. Manual blinds on the side but just in general everything is great quality, everything feels nice and soft to touch and again it's a comfort based car, everything in the back here just screams easy comfort. But as with every car, the driver's seat is oh so tempting and it was only a matter of time where I gave up the Sahib duties of sitting comfortably at the back and took over the wheel myself. Now just like with the last generation ES, which was called the ES 300H, which means it was available only with a hybrid powertrain in India, Lexus has continued the trend and this of course is still bad as the 300H and is again only available as a hybrid. Now, it's the same motor, it's a 2-litre petrol engine, 4-cylinder up front, naturally aspirated, and with the combination of the electric uh, batteries and the electric motor, the engine makes 215 horsepower, which is 15 more than the last generation, and makes 221 newton meters of torque. Now, let me get straight to the point. This is not a performance car. It does 0 to 100 in about 8 seconds or so, which makes it, well, quite slow for its price point and it definitely doesn't like being driven fast. It doesn't like it when you put the pedal to the metal. It is for somebody who wants a comfortable car over performance in terms of what they really want from their luxury car. In terms of comfort though, 
It is great because it is a new platform. It's got a whole new suspension setup. It's got double wishbones in the front, which makes it a lot more comfortable. A new set of dampers. In general, just very comfortable to drive and to be driven in. The Lexus ES in its new avatar has really grown up by a lot. It is more mature and dare we say it, at Rs 59 lakh 13,000 rupees, ex showroom Delhi, it really now is a lot of value for money too. And even if as a luxury car buyer fuel efficiency does matter, the ES gives a whopping 22.37 km per litre, by far the highest in its class. While it does have less space than an E-Class and it doesn't drive as well as the 5 Series does, it does have distinct road presence as an advantage going for it. The ES then, like most Lexus models in India, are for the slightly eccentric buyer who wants something that stands out, although not so obnoxiously so. It isn't fast, it isn't powerful, but it sure is extremely comfortable. And that is a reason you certainly should consider it over the standard Germans. Now that is definitely a very, very comfortable car and I do think that that ES300 will really boost Lexus's image in India, uh, getting a lot more sales in that sort of C-Class, E-Class uh, segment. Now let's move on to something a little more, uh, a little cool, a little more fun. Uh, Samir was in Japan recently and he visited the, uh, the uh, Yamaha Museum there and uh, of course a lot of bikes, a lot of uh, really fun stuff and if you are a MotoGP fan, a lot of that too. Check this out because it's very, very special. The fact that Yamaha makes mean machines is well known and we had the opportunity to understand Yamaha as a company and its history since inception. So we paid a visit to the Yamaha Communications Plaza at the company's headquarters in Yamamatsu, Japan to get a real sense of what Yamaha's legacy is. We know Yamaha as a brand, we know its scooters, its motorcycles. But where did it all begin? Of course in Japan and we are at the Yamaha Communication Plaza in Itawa and with us is the YA1, the very first Yamaha motorcycle to be produced back in 1955. And that very same year, the YA1 also entered a racing competition in Japan and that's when Yamaha's racing legacy also began. The motorsport section of the plaza hosts 17 of Yamaha's championship winning motorcycles from the last 50 years and as an absolute treat for the eyes. Yamaha picked up its first MotoGP win in 1964 on the RD56, which went on to win 15 Grand Prix races between 1963 and 1965. One of the very interesting exhibits at the Yamaha Communication Plaza is this small 50cc scooter called the Yamaha Pasol. What really makes this interesting is not the fact that it's so tiny and well just 50 cc's but the fact that this is what developed the modern scooters as we know it. Given the popularity of modern scooters from every manufacturer out there, well this is all, it, all it, where it started. So the entire concept of a step through scooter instead of a leg over mounting scooter actually started with the Pasol. So yes, you have to thank Yamaha for that. The Yamaha Communications Plaza is a must visit for every auto enthusiast visiting Japan. Just two hours away from Tokyo in a bullet train, it is well worth the trip. You can spend an entire day here and have something to look forward to. And we assure you, you will come back with a deeper understanding of Yamaha's rich lineage. Let's quickly head into a commercial break. Now on the other side, two big bikes from Suzuki go head to head. Welcome back to CNB Bazaar Buzz, you're on the NDTV network. And now, big bikes is something that we rarely actually cover, but we do love riding them. But what if you want a Suzuki in particular, but you still want to have like a middleweight capacity motorcycle, a 650 to 750? Well, Suzuki has two options in that category. 
we get them head to head to see which one is the best. The story of two Suzuki's. One is an adventure tourer. In fact, it's the newest adventure tourer in the market, the V Strom 650 XT. And the other? Well, it's a performance naked, the GSX S750. How does an adventurer tourer compare with a performance naked? Now, if you're a guy who's looking to buy your first big bike, you have a budget of say just under 10 lakh rupees, the V Strom 650 will do everything quite satisfactorily. You want a one size fits all bike. You can commute on it, you can do your weekend rides on it, you can do your long rides and you can even do the high Himalayas on it. Think of Ladakh and Spiti, the V-Strom will do it quite satisfactorily. The problem arises when you walk into the Suzuki showroom to book one. There, you'll be caught in a dilemma. The V-Strom 650 XT has typical adventure bike design. Tall, imposing stance, the front peak, tall windshield and wire spoke wheels shod with tubeless tyres. It's built well and the quality of plastic, the finish is top-notch. It feels like a bike which will last and ready to take to the long road on your two-wheeled adventure. At almost the same price, you have this, the Suzuki GSX S750. While it's a 750cc engine compared to a 650, it's an inline four cylinder engine. It's butter smooth, more powerful. But then, a street bike over an adventure tourer? Hmm. The GSX S750 is nothing like the V Strom 650. It has muscular naked looks with a fat fuel tank with sharp creases, fat upside down front forks, complemented by wheels shod with fat rubber. And it looks coiled and ready to spring into action. At heart though, it's more of a street bike, focused on performance rather than on touring. And performance is where it scores big time. And it's a free revving engine which will rev close to 11,000 RPM. The four-cylinder 749cc engine is butter smooth. But it's not just about engine refinement, it's about how the GSX S750 performs. The strong mid-range and the intake roar of the engine will have you grinning inside your helmet. And soon as you cross 7,000 revs, the world will be a blur. It's more than enough performance to entertain anybody, regardless of your experience or riding skills. Now don't get me wrong here, I'm all for adventure bikes. They've got a comfortable riding position, you sit upright, you can go on a long ride and you can of course ride it in the city. But if you're the true blue off-road riding, that's where the V-Strom 650 lacks some serious kit. Now for most riders, this can easily go over rocky trails, a usual gravel road and the like. But the limited suspension travel and a limited ground clearance will rob you of some serious off-road riding. You could argue both bikes are as different as chalk and cheese. And you're not mistaken. The V-Strom 650 XT is an adventurer tourer suited for the long hours in the saddle to cover long distances. And it absolutely excels in that. It's more of a tarmac-oriented touring machine than an out-and-out off-road bike. Although it can take on the occasional rough road or traverse terrain where the road ends. It may not have the hardware or the performance to take on the GSX S750, but everything the V-Strom 650 does, it does without a complaint. In comparison, the GSX S750 is more a street-oriented bike, which you can take to the racetrack occasionally as well. Sure, you can go on long rides on it as well. The riding position isn't so committed to make you take frequent breaks. But the nature of the engine will have you exploring the 750's performance over and over again. And that could be slightly tiring over a day's ride. And the more you rev the engine, the thirstier the engine will be, limiting your range on a tank full of fuel. 
the Suzuki GSX S750 inline four cylinder engine which is butter smooth makes about 112 bhp of power and that sound absolutely makes me go bonkers now rationally speaking the V-Strom 650 makes more sense but every once in a while you have to follow your heart and this one will put a smile on your face every time you take it out for a spin and that's the reason I walk into Suzuki showroom I'll pick the GSX S750 At 7,46,000 rupees X showroom, the Suzuki GSX S750 is fantastic value for money. A superb engine, fantastic road manners and a highly entertaining performance makes it worth every rupee you spend on it. And that's the reason it will be money worth spent if you decide to pick the GSX S750. And that's all we have time for this week on CNB Bazaar Buzz. We do hope you liked our special non-standard sort of comparison tests there. Because of course they're very similarly priced and they do go head to head against each other. And I'm sure Preetam had a lot of fun riding these around too. Thank you so much for watching as always. And remember, wear that helmet if you're, in a, uh, if you're on a two-wheeler. Wear that seat belt if you're in a car. Safe driving and riding. We'll see you next week. Thank you so much for watching and see you soon.